attendees today. Um, hopefully you can hear me and you'll let me know if there's a, is a problem. Um, uh, I am in, in, in Hull, which is in a lovely, lovely uh, summer spring day today. Um, I should say I don't usually wear a hat, but I have a few um, uh, I, I have, a, have a few health problems at the moment, so that, that's that's a reason for this. Um, I, if you if you're wondering where the accent's from, it's it's from uh, I'm a, a proper southerner from uh, the deep south of New Zealand, uh, not not uh, from a so a southerner from the southern part of the southern hemisphere, uh, and I came to University of Hull uh, to take over as direct res, director of the Wilberforce Institute uh, in uh, February 2020. An interesting time to start uh, that particular that particular job and the Wilberforce Institute does three things. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that and I'm going to then I'll raise a little bit about Wilberforce uh, and then talk about a particular problem of how we might be commemorating him uh, in the next uh, in, in, in the next decade or so. Uh, the Wilberforce Institute is a standalone research institute uh, which studies three things in particular, uh, although it looks at slavery in all its aspects. Um, and the three things we look at are the historic, historical legacies of slavery, or the start with the history of slavery uh, from uh, the beginning from Mesopotamia to uh, to the present day, but with a particular interest uh, it, emphasis, given we're in Britain, given the nature of William Wilberforce on transatlantic slavery. My own expertise is on American slavery uh, and uh, with a particular interest in Jamaican slavery, uh, which in the 18th century, I think is very much part of uh, American history. Uh, so what, what, perhaps one of the things we were most, most prominent for uh, was was a leading the one of the leaders in the transatlantic slave trade database, uh, which is one of the great digital projects, uh, not just in history but in all areas of of academia and and historicals and and scholarship, uh, which established for the first time uh, where the numbers of enslaved people who went to the Americas uh, and the where they came from. And of course, one of the things we always need to point out to Americans in particular is that only 4% went to what later became the United States of America. 80% uh, went to Brazil and the Caribbean. The second thing that we're interested in is the legacies of slavery, uh, in particular, the ways in which slavery has slavery from the 18th century uh, in Britain has an impact on all sorts of institutions uh, from the royal family, which has been uh, quite prominent recently, to the Church of England, uh, to institutions like Lloyd's, for example, uh, and most least recently with The Guardian. And we're very pleased that we've been involved in a partnership with The Guardian, where they're spending £10 million uh, on various aspects due to diversity uh, relating to their connections in the 19th century with slavery in general. And the third thing that we're interested in is modern slavery, um, which unfortunately is very much a growth industry, uh, has has developed, is, is, is a very big part of the world uh, and an increasing part of Britain. Uh, and if, if you're from, coming from America, of America as well. So those are the sort of things that we do. Uh, and we're, we're very much connect, connected to uh, this man, William Wilberforce. And certainly when I first arrived in Britain in 2020, uh, had been in Britain before, of course, uh, spent 10 years uh, at various universities in the 2000s, but then had been at the University of Melbourne uh, in the 2010. But I was really delighted to become the Wilberforce Professor. Uh, little did I know that when you come to Hull, uh, just about everything is named Wilberforce. Uh, I get my drugs from a Wilberforce pharmacy, the medic, my, my doctor's a Wilberforce medical system, medical system, there's a high school there's a train named after William Wilberforce. He's someone who is very much beloved uh, in this town. And indeed, there is a huge statue of Wilber William, William Wilberforce put up in 1924, uh, 1934, sorry, 1934, uh, as a way of commemorating the 100th anniversary of the abolition of slavery. William Wilberforce was a remarkable man. Uh, he was born in 1759 and died in 1833. He was from a very wealthy family. Uh, he, his, he, and he could have easily, uh, and he started off doing this, he could have easily just uh, spent his time in dissipation uh, or spent his time in uh, various types of pursuits, uh, cultural or literary pursuits or established, as he did do, a strong political career. In the 1780s, he had a 
he he, be, he became a born again Christian, became an evangelical, uh, part of the, the wing of the Anglican Church. Uh, fortunately for his relatives, he did not become a Methodist because they thought that was a, a particularly dreadful thing that might have happened. But he be, he, he decided to devote uh, his life uh, to something which was at that stage still not something that people had thought of as being uh, a real problem and that was the abolition of slave the slave trade uh, and then later the abolition of slavery when i'm talking to students i always put this uh, slide up about william wilberforce starting off in 1759 uh, when he was born to bring forward the point that when he was born britain uh, depended very much on slavery. Britain made lots and lots of money from slavery, not Wilberforce himself, though some of his relatives were connected to slavery. Places like Liverpool, London, Bristol, heavily involved in slavery. Uh, and everybody thought that slavery was pretty much an unremarkable thing, at least when it involved uh, Africans uh, who would produce things like sugar in particular, but also things like tobacco, which were useful. In other words, and I, I ask, often ask students to think what 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 type of what type of things would you compare it to? They often usually say fossil fuels, for example, uh, something which seems so impossible uh, to imagine the world without, uh, but something which went which 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 ended pretty quickly. By the, by his death on 29th of July, 1833. Uh, Britain had not only given up the, the slave trade, which was at Wilberforce's major contribution uh, to the history of, of slavery and anti-slavery, uh, but was on the verge of giving up uh, the, the, the slavery entirely. He died three or four days uh, before slavery was abolished throughout the British Empire. And the thing that I would always want to say to students is just imagine how different, how do, how do we get from 1759 to 1833? How do we get to under, having, having, having an a, a institution which had lasted forever, which everybody sort of thought of as being pretty, uh, pretty much normal, uh, which brought Britain a great deal of wealth, uh, to coming to see it as a sin? Wilberforce thought very much in Christian ways, seeing it as a sin, uh, and then getting rid of it uh, in, in this in these these particular ways. How do we understand a change of consciousness from seeing something going something seeing something which is normal to seeing something which is is evil? And I think that's one of the biggest things that we want to do uh, in looking at Wilberforce is to understand that change of consciousness uh, in British thinking and American thinking as well. Uh, the, Amer the American route to uh, the end of slavery took a different different route. Uh, different but took different directions than that by Britain and its empire but how are we meant to do those to do those Wilberforce is, is a prominent in a variety of ways he's most important I think for the abolition of the slave trade uh, which was, happened in 1807 uh, probably would have happened in the 1790s if a French Revolution hadn't occurred and possibly would have happened if there hadn't been such determined opposition from a royal family uh, who probably delayed abolition for about a decade or so. But he, he and his great friend William Pitt, uh, Wilberforce was a Tory of, of a sorts, didn't belong to the Tory party but had Tory leanings, uh, worked tirelessly in the 1790s and, 18, and 1800s to abolish the slave trade. He later then became part of the Sierra Leone colony, uh, which is where liberated Africans, people who had been taken by the Royal Navy off slave ships and returned to Africa, uh, were, were, were involved with. In 1823, in other words, 200 years almost to the day, uh, Wilberforce was involved in his last set piece uh, in, the, in, in his life, which was to be the, the key speaker. Uh, in the anti-slavery society from 1823. He was nowhere near as important in getting in, in the abolition of slavery. He was quite an old man by this stage. He wasn't as anywhere near as important in the abolishment of slavery as he was in the abolishment of the abolition of the slave trade. But he participated in all these sorts of ways. So I've talked at length about him because I want, in some ways or other, uh, he is a great man, undoubtedly a great man. And certainly if you come to Hull, uh, you will see Wilberforce portrait pictured everywhere. And it's very much considered uh, that he is a great man as well.
But one of the things that we're doing at the Wilberforce Institute, and this, I guess, is the, the, the sort of ways I want to combine both history with the mission of the Wilberforce Institute and various problems, various issues that I think are going to be very important for Britain uh, in the next uh, 10 years or so, uh, is to see Wilberforce um, in relationship to another huge celebration uh, in 1834 or commemoration, uh, celebration or commemoration, which would be the abolition of the of, of slavery. And I want to raise a sort of question in, in this way because commemorating major events is a very fraught thing. I don't know if any of you read the New York Times today, but my heart rather sank when I saw uh, that uh, ex-president Donald Trump uh, wants to have a, a year-long celebration uh, of the American Revolution in, tw in, tw uh, in, in, in 2026. Uh, and I suppose as a scholar of the American Revolution myself, I should welcome that. But it does seem that the American Revolution and how it's going to be celebrated is going to get tied up uh, with all sorts of aspects of particular political, po contemporary politics, which is going to make it very difficult for scholars uh, to get a real appreciation of this period. And I've put up here a, a, a slide of, uh, and the next slide will be the same, uh, to or similar to this, uh, to talk about what was an issue in 2007. I remember in 2007 uh, talking to a BBC presenter, uh, to a BBC producer, uh, who said that 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 year, which was a year of many celebrations, they were deciding on what were the what were the major uh, celebrations uh, that were going to occur in Britain, and they picked up four. And here are two of them. Here's one with the late Queen uh, at Jamestown, uh, talking about uh, celebrating the founding of Jamestown in 1607. In other words, 400 years uh, since Brit since England uh, started to colonise America. The second was the union of Britain, of England and Wales and Scotland in 1707. In other words, the making of Britain. Two huge events. But if you want to remember from, from from if anyone of you remember from two south two thousand and seven, both of them had no purchase whatsoever. Uh, the third one, which in two thousand and seven they thought would have a lot of interest, but which got zero interest in Britain whatsoever, uh, was the Falklands War. Twenty five years uh, after Britain had won uh, the, a battle in in the Falklands, so a three three of the major possible celebrations: sixteen oh seven, seventeen oh seven, nineteen eighty two, got no traction whatsoever. What was unusual that year is the thing that, that, that what people were what the public was interested in. Uh, was uh, something that no one no one had even really thought about, which was the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. And I can remember from that year a whole lot of hastily produced documentaries uh, coming out at the end of uh, end of 2007, uh, which talked about this particular one. The one event, however, which called, got a great deal of attention in Britain was 1807 in which Wilberforce was uh, heavily, heavily involved. And that's the abolition of the slave trade uh, and, 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 but it, and in, in 1807. And I put aside there a, a speech by, uh, an advertisement for a speech by Jim Walvin, a friend of ours uh, at the Wilberforce Institute. And I think he gave 75 uh, talks in that particular year uh, on slavery, how we should remember the slave trade, public history, and all those sorts of things. Stamps came out, uh, huge amounts of a uh, huge amount of activities was put forward. At the University of Hull, we had a huge uh, a huge gathering uh, whereby Archbishop Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who was the patron of the Wilberforce Institute, was the uh, key speaker. Uh, Cherie Blair was there. It was all sorts of things. And the slave, the, the slave trade took uh, the abolition of the slave trade uh, was 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 something which was uh, a huge event. It did did cause, however, quite a lot of people uh, some uh, some some consternation uh, because the abolition of the slave trade in eighteen o seven is not something which go, is just is unproblematic. It has a history. 
the commemorations themselves and it is connected very much to how Britain might see itself. Indeed, if you read the more right-wing papers like the Telegraph and the Daily Mail, Mail and particularly if you read comments behind, beyond, 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 below the line uh, on any type of article which talks about slavery or the abolition of slavery, you will get an awful lot of awful lot of things where, whereby people say uh, what, is this justifies Britain. Uh, because Britain was the first country to abolish slavery. Aren't we great to do so? Those who study slavery would say, well, yes, you, you Britain did abolish slavery uh, through people like Wilberforce, which is very good, uh, but it profited a hugely amount beforehand. The abolition of slavery, and here you'll see here a, uh, a statue put up in 1933 uh, of Wilberforce. Uh, it's still there, so, so still very large, uh, very imposing, um, and it has has Wilberforce, the the, the friend of a Negro slave, uh, on its uh, its base. We probably wouldn't use Negro nowadays, but of course in 1933 that was the the term that people used, uh, and it was very much that that period that when the hundredth abolition of slavery, uh, the abolition of slavery was put forward and and very much a un. Un was uncontested about what it might be. Uh, for W. H. Leckie in 1869, uh, the abolition of the slave trade uh, was 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 something to be celebrated as justification uh, for British behaviour. As he put it, the unwary, unostentatious, and inglorious crusade of England against slavery was among the, one of the three or four perfectly virtuous acts recorded in the history of nations. Uh, justifying all sorts of things, etc. Reginald Coupland, the major historian of the periods, so Reginald Coupland, who opened the uh, the statue, who, who, who opened the statue in 1933 to a crowd of about 100,000 people from Hull, uh, said that 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 that, that maybe that politics is often no more than a mask for the strife of rival interests, but the lives and work of Wilberforce and the saints. A certain proof that not only individuals but the common will, the state itself, can rise on occasion to the heights of pure unselfishness. And David Cameron, Prime Minister, about five uh, in the Tory administration, which has been I mean, in power since two, 2010, uh, talked about in 2014 uh, when he when he went to Jamaica uh, that uh, Britain deserved all sorts of credit because this is a country that helped abolish slavery. In other words, it was a justification in many ways uh, for what we what might be doing. The abolition of slavery in 2007, and what I'll get onto, I guess, is is is, is soon is uh, how we're going to move in the future. But it's worthwhile talking a little bit about the the how the abolition of slavery in 2007 uh, was commemorated, uh, because it raised some big questions. Uh, and this is the statue of, Wil of, of William Wilberforce uh, right in Wilberforce House, which is next door to the Wilberforce Institute. Uh, and every day I look out and see uh, Wilberforce uh, gazing over his, his nice garden in this period. A celebration commemorates the past, but it also reflects very much on the present. Uh, so when we look at the abolition of the slave trade in 2007, the 200th anniversary of it, it says a lot about 1807, but it says a lot about 2007 as well. And things have moved on from 2007 and in part because of the celebration in 2007 as well. There are two tensions, I think, which are important. How do we move from the abolition of the slave trade through the through slave trade to, to, through, to slave rebellion, to abolition of slavery, to apprenticeship uh, and compensation. How do we deal with changes in scholarship on slavery and the slave trade uh, from 2007 to 2023? How do we guess what might be uh, the changes in scholarship between 2023 and 2033? So at the moment, many of us uh, including in the Wilberforce Institute, are thinking about how we might celebrate or commemorate uh, or even lament in some ways uh, the abolition of slavery uh, of 1834, uh, 1833, 1834. How do we deal with it and what are going to be probably quite a lot of celebrations uh, in 
in, in 1833, in 20, 30, sorry, 20, 20, uh, 21, uh, 2033, 2034. And what would be the role of people like Wilberforce uh, in that particular in that particular celebration and commemoration? And for Americans, I guess there'll be a similar sorts of things. And of course, America has uh, its own celebrations uh, it, it itself. Uh, and we'll be facing, I guess, some of the things that uh, face that BBC producer in 2007. Uh, will it be something which attracts the attention uh, of the public? Uh, will it be something which is hugely political? Uh, and in many ways, I think for most uh, historians, it's not a political thing. Uh, certainly, we certainly both certainly for the Wilberforce Institute and for other places in in Britain, uh, 2007 was celeb was 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 something which was great uh, because it led to more research uh, on slavery. One of the things we did was the anti-slavery usable past project. Uh, Britain as a whole instituted an international slavery museum, uh, therefore making slavery more. Uh, more obvious, more apparent in the history of it, uh, more something from that. What might we learn from 2007, uh, which might be important uh, for the next 10 years, for looking at 2023 and the move to immediate emancipation uh, in Britain. Uh, in other words, an idea that slavery just couldn't be abolished over time, uh, but needed to be abolished quickly. Uh, and the commemoration of the abolition of slavery uh, in 1833 and 2034. And one of the things, I guess, which is apparent is that one of the things that the uh, events of 2007 did uh, was to start a national conversation on slavery, politics of race, and new questions over collective memory. And that's something which has really continued. Indeed, probably in the last year, it's picked up place, picked up pace. Uh, Britain is always talking about what does it mean uh, to have had an empire? What does empire mean? What is its particular position on race? Um, is it much better than America? Uh, is, is it a place which is a racist, racist place? Uh, and those sorts of things. We have police forces, for example, as in Scotland, uh, coming out and saying that the police force is institutionally racist and it's, and it's connected uh, to this long history. Uh, there have been things like the Wilbur, the Windrush uh, issues, uh, whereby uh, people who people who've lived in this country for a long time were sent back to Jamaica and Barbados uh, due for uh, due to due to immigra immigration eras, etc. So, what things will be will be changed? I think one of the things is that is that we will be continuing in a movement. Uh, which has been going for a long time. Certainly that unrelenting emphasis on the goodness of people like Wilberforce, uh, which was so common and, and such, such a common feature of celebrations in 1933, 1934, uh, won't continue. Uh, sometimes that's called Wilberfo Wilberfest. I think it's, that's a rather derogatory term, uh, but the, the celebrating just the, 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 the celebrating Wilberforce and other white uh, abolitionists uh, who who gave uh, slavery? Who gave to slaves their freedom? I don't think anyone uh, from now on would, would would really think about that in particular. Certainly, there's a new emphasis on black abolitionists. Alado Equiano would be would be important, but but other ones as well on women uh, and their role uh, in in the in the abolitionist movement. It's one of the first abolition the first movements where women played a hugely important role. Uh, and we'll be looking at looking it'd be important to look at a whole different type of things. And certainly one of the things that will be completely be, will, will cause us a good deal of of, uh, of concern, a good deal of, of, of which we have to do a lot of consultation with uh, is something like uh, the celebration of the uh, end of, of slavery and using the word celebration in itself is a problematic sort of sense. But the commemoration of these things uh, can cause uh, problems of uh, problems within various communities, um, black community organizations and increasing in this country, uh, black community organizations are split between people who come from Africa, not not from the West Indian tradition and people who come from the West Indies where slavery is important. Um, one of the things, of course, as well, is how do you have activities uh, that leave a legacy? 
that uh, make a difference because many of the activities of 2007 uh, were unrecorded. Uh, there was not much archival storage or conservation uh, and in many ways historians felt it was a bit of a missed opportunity. But certainly since the, that period uh, there's been new thought strands and scholarships of emerging. Uh, more emphasis on slave rebellion, uh, its impact on Africa, the connections of historical slavery to modern slavery. And one of the things that which has really become important in the last couple of years, and we have to have asked questions about that, imagine emergence of debates on reparations and reparative history. What debt? Both in terms of both in terms of apologies, but even perhaps in terms of financial matters, uh, does Britain owe uh, to the places which were built on slavery? And uh, certainly one of the lessons I think that came from 2007 and one of the things that will be important in the next few years uh, is that Atlantic slavery is intertwined in all aspects of British history. Uh, it's no longer something which can be thought of as over there. It's no longer something which is thought of as, as American rather than anything else. So crucial is the event itself. Uh, and how important it is as an historical event. So we'll have to spend a lot of time uh, talking about how the abolition of slavery uh, occurred. In particular, looking at the most controversial act part of that, that particular act, which was the giving of compensation to the enslavers rather than the enslaver. 20 million pounds uh, was given by Britain, one fifth of, of its total national uh, the social national budget in that particular period were given to people as compensation for having lost property and that property being enslaved people. And that's something which uh, was problematic at the time and increasingly is problematic as, as well. Uh, we'll be having to deal with the scholarship around the event and how it has changed. Uh, and the main change, I think, is to be see slavery uh, rather than abolition. Uh, as being increasingly integrated in all aspects of British and world history. I don't think David Cameron would be able to say as blithely as he did in 2014 uh, that Britain Britain has uh, get, should get all sorts of credit because it abolished slavery, because everyone knows that Britain also uh, was heavily involved in slavery and implementing it in America, uh, in the Caribbean, uh, and having connections in Africa as well. How much money will be given by the government uh, to this is an important thing. Uh, in 2007, uh, huge amounts of money uh, were given to commemorate uh, the abolition of the slave trade. Will the same things be occurring uh, later on? And of course, one of the things that we don't know uh, is uh, about what sort of national, what sorts of uh, contemporary affairs uh, might happen. If we think between 2007 uh, and 2023, uh, some major things have occurred which change the ways in which we think of these particular acts uh, which are connected to the present day. And I've only just listed a few here. Uh, the passing of a modern slavery act in 2015. Uh, Britain and Australia are the only two places in the world, only two countries in the world which have that. Uh, the ongoing issues of Brexit and immigration which continue to royal uh, British politics. The Windrush scandal in generation. Uh, the rise of Black Lives Matter in 2020, uh, which had a different manifestation in Britain than it did in America. Uh, public controversies over statues and country houses, uh, the extent to which individuals and organisations have benefited from slavery. And, and certainly in recent times, for example, there's been a lot of discussion about the royal family and its involvement in slavery and a growing push towards reparations. So there's a whole number of things which are important. I think one of the most important, I hardly need to go through it, I guess, would be uh, the Black Lives Matter of 2020. I think that did change uh, an awful lot of things about how we might look at these particular areas. And when we think of anniversaries, we have to remember that uh, as in 2007, there are many anniversaries which occur at, at, at the same time. Uh, those of us who are in the Wilberforce Institute, those of us involved in slavery uh, studies, uh, thinking automatically that the big event of the year is going to be uh, the 200th, ab 200th commemoration of the abolition of slavery. But a little small thing happened in Germany 100 years ago, uh, which might lead to, to uh, commemorations as well, uh, Adolf Hitler becoming Chancellor of Germany in 1933. 
uh, and given given what we know about the popularity uh, of people reading about Nazis, about Germans, uh, German history, about World War II, um, it's, it, it's, it's, it's entirely possible uh, that this event might crowd out uh, the abolition of slavery, particularly if the abolition of slavery uh, raises difficult, difficult, difficult questions. Um, one of the things I would think was very interesting is why 1607, uh, the movement of English migrants uh, to America uh, got to, to Jamestown in Virginia, uh, got no interest at all uh, in Britain at that particular stage. So different anniversaries might occur as well. I won't go through here, but one of the things I think is important to say is that uh, there's been a lot of changes in scholarships in, in, in this way. Uh, and and we can think we can see a variety of ones of uh, just listen. I can give you the, the uh, links to this later on, but we see them in, in all sorts of ways. The increasing way in which slavery is connected to British history in all sorts of ways. And we can see that in controversies over the National Trust. Um, country houses, the royal family, and all those sorts of things. The relationship between slavery and capitalism, uh, to what extent was slavery important uh, in developing the Industrial Revolution, in making Britain rich? Uh, what does it mean about the Caribbean? And the Caribbean is particularly interested in reparations. How do we judge the, the role of enslaved people themselves? and bringing up and bringing about abolition and the fact that abolition changed in, in 1823 from an idea that it could be done gradually to what an idea that it had to be done straight away is very much connected to a big rebellion in Demerara in uh, what is now British in what was now Guyana uh, in the north uh, east of South America uh, in that particular period Abolitionism also is a transatlantic and popular movement. My, uh, the, the previous director of the Wilberforce Institute uh, has written brilliantly on how abolitionism was something which connected progressive politics uh, in both Britain and America in this particular period. Uh, and that we see now uh, the Caribbean as being more important, as, as central in these sorts of ways. We're also starting to see a, a different view of looking at slavery. Uh, it used to be very much that slavery was something which was American. Uh, it came from America. It, it, most of the scholarship was about America. Uh, and what was interesting was anti -abolition, was, was, was abolitionist um, activities. We think things differently now. I put a couple of books up here, one by Jim Walvin, who I mentioned previously, uh, one of a writing of the history of slavery, in which slavery is seen in two different ways. One is it's seen as something which goes back a very long time, all the way to Mesopotamia, uh, and as something which is important in most societies at most times, and is not necessarily just tied up uh, with Africans moving to the new world. So slavery itself, the study of slavery is changing. Uh, and it, it's something which is seen as not, as, as, not uh, as in the past, something peculiar. Americans talk about it as a peculiar institution. Uh, it's seen very much as central uh, to the making of the modern world, uh, to the making of the ancient world uh, at the same way, at that same time. Certainly a new consensus, I guess, is that the modal, modal state slave is not the enslaved person living in the American South, uh, but is increasingly the Caribbean, a slave living in the Caribbean producing sugar uh, and place things like the Haitian Revolution uh, have had a much greater, uh, greater say uh, in these places. And as we've moved from looking at moving slavery from antebellum America to 18th century Caribbean, we've concentrated on themes uh, which make slavery ever darker. So one of the things as historians we're going to have real problems with, I think, uh, in, 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 the, in the commemorations uh, in 1833-1834 uh, is the same sort of things that are, that, that are difficult for the people who study the Holocaust. Uh, slavery was so violent, so destructive, slave owners were so brutal. Uh, we have to worry very much about how we can present that history uh, to other people. My, 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 the book which probably I, I'm most well known for uh, is of a person who lived very close to here in Lincoln, a man named Thomas Sisserwood of Jamaica, left 37 years of diaries uh, of his life among slaves uh, between 1750 and 1786 uh, in Jamaica. And it's an unrelenting tale of rape, of violence, of all sorts of things. Um, it's difficult to read. 
my wife still hasn't managed to read more than about 10 pages of a book just because it's such a it's such a difficult tale and those sorts of things are going to be things that are very important particularly if we're involving uh, how if we're trying to say well how do we talk about slavery uh, to young people to people who don't know much about slavery as as well Certainly one thing I think will be important is that slavery uh, will be seen as very much integral to British history, not something that happened out elsewhere. And here are some famous 17th century uh, Englishmen uh, with an enslaved, say, enslaved young man uh, at, at the side. That's sort of the thing that we're seeing increasingly in this period. We'll also see slavery as being something which is important uh, financially. And I've just put a little bit of things here, some figures about just how important West Indian slavery uh, was to Britain in this particular period. Uh, Jamaica, Barbados provided a huge amount of wealth through sugar, through plantations, uh, perhaps 6% of British GDP, uh, which is not, it's not overwhelming, but it's pretty big. Uh, it was produced by enslaved people in that particular period. And I think that's one of the things we will be dealing with it. So how will we deal with William Wilberforce, with the person that we we looked at in, 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 in the period beforehand? Well, I guess one thing way we could look at it is we could just ignore him and say that he wasn't important. Uh, some opposition from various various people uh, to Wilberforce are, are that he is a, a white saviour. I think it's a rather offensive term, but certainly that's something which is sometimes put forward uh, as someone who was speaking on behalf of black people rather than uh, incorporating them to incorporating them. And of course, Wilberforce uh, was a mix of particular attitudes. There's a wonderful biography by William Law Haig uh, of, of him, perhaps the, the only one really at, at, at the moment. Uh, and of course, he had uh, as well as uh, added, as well as his campaign about about uh, to to end the, the uh, to end the slave trade. Uh, he was also involved. He, he was also keen uh, to make uh, to, to make changes to the poor law, uh, insofar as making the poor people work harder. He was a highly controversial figure in his time. Uh, he's here's a scurrilous cartoon of Wilberforce. Uh, celebrating the abolition of the slave trade with the Bishop of London, uh, with two uh, grotesque black women, with a whole lot of paintings on the side about various forms of West Indian brutality. In other words, it's, 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 it, there was there were arguments at the time that, that Wilberforce was a complete, complete hypocrite about this. And here, of course, is what a famous, famous cartoon of the period. Uh, where he's uh, show, covering the genitals of a uh, of Achilles or a, a Apollo of, of a great hero. In other words, that that William Wilberforce, uh, Thomas Clarks, and all the people who were um, were arguing against slavery and against the slave trade were just do-gooders who wanted people to stop having fun in this for these particular ways and one of the things that we'll be trying to do i guess is to is to realize those sorts of things i think we'll be emphasizing a great deal more than we did in 2007 the role that africans themselves and enslaved people themselves played uh, in causing the abolition of slavery looking at the rebellions Demerara in 1823, I've already mentioned, very important in moving from gradual to immediate emancipation, and the great rebellions in Jamaica in 1831 to 1832, which convinced an awful lot of British statesmen uh, that slavery was unsustainable, both because of the huge amount of destruction it caused and because uh, various people in Jamaica, um, including most notably Kamala Harris's uh, ancestor, uh, who was one of the most virulent, uh, Hamilton Brown, one of the most virulent racists in that particular period. Uh, the, the, the planters were, were, were incorrigible and they couldn't really do things and encouraged, the, encouraged uh, to, them to speed up uh, the abolition process. The other thing I think we'll, we'll be recognising, this is one of the trends in recent times, is just how many people were in favour of slavery. Uh, here we have uh, two of the most important of the period. Uh, we have uh, Will, Will, William Duke of Clarence, uh, who apparently had a uh, flirtation with a with an Af with a free woman of colour uh, in Barbados, and was the leader of the pro-slavery uh, group within uh, within Parliament in 1807. 
ironically, he's the person who signed the abolition of slavery uh, into into law uh, and was only persuaded to do so because uh, the people who got to sign it said it was bound to bound to fail. But Duke of Wellington, not particularly involved in pro-slavery, but representative of a whole group of Tories uh, in, in the Tory government in the late 1820s, um, prior to the Reform Act, which brought the Whigs in, uh, who were determined to, who, who thought not only uh, that slavery was economically beneficial, but were opposed to such, such revolutionary schemes uh, in general, because they would bring on things like the French Revolution and so on. And we need to remember also, I think, uh, how the abolition of slavery uh, did not solve everything. Here's a marvellous cartoon uh, from the 1830s, uh, which I can't go through the whole details there, but you see someone looking through a telescope. Uh, a clergyman is holding a uh, a picture of of uh, someone whipping a black, slat, black person, but, but if he'd actually been able to look uh, at uh, the West Indies, he would have seen lots of very happy people dancing uh, and, and having good time, fed very well. Uh, whereas at home, uh, but this is what the cartoon is saying: uh, all is dead, all is all is dreadful uh, and and terrible. And the same sorts of things which you often get about all sorts of things as well it was was, was it's in the present day were apparent in the 1830s as well. Why are we worrying so much about what happens overseas when we really should be looking after our own people? We have enough problems here without worrying about the problems of other people as well. And another cartoon as well has had a John Bull being fleeced uh, by, by, well, that's not John Bull, but the British taxpayer being fleeced uh, by people taking for, for paying money to uh, slave owners for compensation at the same time as rather grotesquely and uh, grotesquely portrayed. It's a very racist cartoon. Uh, grotesquely uh, portrayed uh, Africans are dancing and, and having a good time and obviously very well fed uh, in, in the Caribbean. In other words, just because the abolition of slavery occurred uh, didn't mean that everybody liked it in that particular period. So just to conclude is that I think we have a lot uh, to think about. Uh, I think we'll be moving away from the simplistic ideas of 1933 Wilberforce as a uh, as a liberator, Wilberforce as a great emancipator. I don't think we're moving into seeing Wilberforce as a white saviour, but we probably were moving away from the statue, uh, which you can see uh, on the left here, which talks about Wilberforce's great, 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 uh, great achievements. And we'll be considering such things as as uh, Britain's long and sometimes difficult history uh, with race relations, and that's the Windrush Monument monument uh, at uh, some 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 train station in uh, in 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 London. Um, so hopefully that gives you some idea of what what sort of things that uh, we want to do. And what I hope I've done today is give you firstly uh, an introduction to the Wilberforce Institute and the various things that we're doing, and to and to give you an insight into a particular problem that we we have, uh, a particular opportunity, uh, and it's the interplay between how historians treat history uh, and how historians uh, deal with. Uh, the reception of that history uh, into the present day. So I'll turn you over to Stephanie. If you could get rid of the, uh, I'm not quite sure how to get rid of the PowerPoint. If you're able to do that, Stephanie. Not. Uh, but, but 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 welcome welcome of course to uh, have any any questions. Yes. Um, so I'll go ahead and stop sharing this as requested. Um, thank you, uh, Professor Bernard. This was really enlightening and very, very interesting, um, particularly as an American, as someone who's sort of seen it from the other side of the Atlantic. It was very interesting to hear a British perspective on it. Um, I'm sure that our established attendees probably have questions, so I'll go ahead and open the floor if you guys would like to ask questions about the presentation or questions more broadly about the University of Hull. Uh, please, by all means, now is your time. Okay, if a few quiet. So I guess I'll sort of take this opportunity, um, Professor Bernard, to sort of ask you a few questions in relation to the university more broadly. Um, so you mentioned that the Wilberforce Institute is 
based within the university? Is it based within a particular faculty or is it sort of a standalone entity? At, at, the, moment it's a stand, at the moment, it's a standalone thing. I think one of the things that, that the University of Hull uh, has a, um, uh, is, is sees itself as doing is having two particular functions and they're very much connected uh, to the particular environment which Hull's in. Um, one one is one is a commitment to sustainability uh, mm. to the environments. How we we are very aware, for example, that Hull is the uh, the, the the city. If there are floods, Hull is the, is the city in in, in Britain uh, which will have the most most uh, difficulty because uh, huge amounts of it are underwater. So very very much in terms of uh, environmental issues, energy, those sorts of things are important. The other thing, and it really much draws on the history of Hull, which is is that Hull sees itself as you can see in the Wilberforce monument uh, as a place which has been devoted to social justice um, so I think that so I think one of the two things is we have two two major research institutes environmental uh, energy and environment uh, and the Wilberforce Institute uh, which really which cover two of the important areas uh, that the university sees itself as providing something important, which is in terms of sustainability uh, and, and, and environmental justice and social justice. Um, and I think the Wilberforce Institute, which has been around since 2006 uh, and which has been dealing with these uh, these sorts of issues, uh, is a particularly interest, important as a flagship for the university uh, in seeing its, its social justice mission. Um, and it's a way of connecting between what students are interested in, because they are very much interested in these sorts of things, uh, and what uh, the people of Hull and this particular region are also interested in as well. I'm really glad that you've highlighted social justice because I see that as a sort of reoccurring area of both great academic interest, but also personal passion for a great many of our scholars and indeed young people throughout their generation. That's right. And, and I think one of the things we say is that I mean, you know, there are all sorts of aspects of social justice, but we but our emphasis on slavery shows that we do have a particular area where we think we can make a contribution. It's not just social justice in general, um, and it's mm -hmm. not something which you've only come lately to. It's something that, that, that is, is, is very much connected to a major a major societal problem, uh, both historically uh, and in the present day, which is the uh, evil of slavery. Well, one of the areas then, um, I just want to give you a, just one more question, if I may, from unless anyone else on the floor would like to pop a question into the chat is could you talk about maybe a few kind of social justice oriented programs at the University of Hull that may sort of appeal to perhaps the American audience or just audiences more broadly? Um, well, I'm not probably the best guy to, to, to doing all those to doing those things, but there are a couple of a couple of areas. One, one for example, we do have a, a program which looks at um, uh, literature in prisons and in, 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 in prison reform, etc. Uh, that's that's quite important. Within the Wilberforce Institute, we have a, a Centre for Modern Slavery, so it connects with the uh, Humber, Humber, Humberside Police and with students um, in terms of uh, trying to deal with modern modern slavery in in, in general. Um, there are a variety of other other ones as well, but those are a couple that I would I would sort of would sort of point at in in, in particular. Um, I'm sure someone who knows who's, who's much more attuned to students. There's always a problem when you're a research director. You you know more about the research areas than you do about what students uh, are, are, are interested in. But we know, for example, that students are particularly interested, uh, and we have a number of student groups in this way, encountering in, encountering modern slavery. And we do uh, we do within our institute and within the university quite a lot in those sorts of areas. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for sort of taking the time to not only shed some light on the fascinating viewpoints of Liam Wilberforce and the sort of troubled legacy, I guess we'll call it, um, but also kind of shedding more light on the wonderful work being done at the University of Hull in the areas of social justice, environmental justice and uh, modern day slavery. So thank you very much for that. Thank you to everyone for attending today. It was a pleasure to have you all. And yeah, we'll go ahead and leave it there. But thank you again to Professor Bernard and thank you to the University of Hull for putting on this fantastic chat. Thanks, thank, guys. thank you very much. For the, thank you very much for the invitation. It was a delight. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you very much, everybody. Okay.
Thank you. Mm. No worries. Bye.